Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Scrum Down NBC Sports Rugby Podcast. I am your host with the most, Alex Corbusera, and it's great to be back, everyone. And for all of those listening who can't see where I am on video, I am on site at Infinity Park in Glendale, Colorado, just outside Denver. That is the USA Rugby Eagles on the field behind me. They're getting ready for the Autumn World Cup qualification. Repechage, last chance saloon for them. And we have a special guest on this week's show. We have USA Rugby head coach Gary Goldon to talk all of it. World Cup qualification, disappointment of results, the state of rugby in America, Let's get into it. All right, we are here with our special guest for this week's episode of the Scrum Down, USA Rugby head coach, Gary Gold. We're at Infinity Park. You're deep into your preparations, getting ready for the repechage this, this autumn coming up for USA Rugby. How are things going, mate? Oh, they're going well, thanks, uh, Corbs. Yeah, it's, it's, good to, uh, it's good to just have some uh, training time, some time together with the boys. Uh, we've assembled all our guys that are based in the US. Um, obviously, our European boys are, are full on into their season now in Europe, but uh, MLR, as you know, is over now, and uh, our guys had a little bit of downtime, so it's been a, a wonderful opportunity uh, um, for USA Rugby and World Rugby have helped us get this camp together. So we've, we've got a couple of weeks in camp here at Glendale before we, uh, we head out to play a couple of practice matches out in South Africa. Um, but it's just been brilliant. It's been, it's, it's, it, the guys have worked unbelievably hard for a good couple of weeks now, obviously at altitude. So um, preparing ourselves under the most difficult conditions we possibly can. And it's, it's, it's just been such a long time since we've been able to literally just get together without having, uh, having a game on, on our doorstep four or five days after, after an assembly. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a lot of work on fitness and conditioning. It's been a lot of work on our basics. It's been a lot of work on um, uh, certainty and clarity and giving us confidence to get back onto the park and uh, for preparing for what, as you say, is going to be an incredibly important November. And so last time you guys were together as a squad was kind of in the build up to the Rugby World Cup. You had a bit of time as a yeah. camp, had the World Cup, yeah. you know, some, some positives like you and me have talked about that, some positives at that time, but obviously, you know, it looked like there was going to be more to come and then sort of COVID was really the roadblock for USA Rugby, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that July of 2020, I mean, uh, I don't know if you remember, but we, we were due to play Italy in that, in that, uh, in that summer series. Uh, we had three test matches planned and one of them was going to be against Italy. So uh, we were going to be able to get the guys together for uh, some time during the MLR for preparation. And then uh, we were good to go for that full uh, month period in, in July. And unfortunately, COVID hit and, you know, and then doubled down with the fact that uh, USA Rugby unfortunately had some financial issues. So, you know, that closed the doors for, well, well over 12 months. And from our point of view, we've never been able to do a training camp like this since then. And so, like, let's look back to almost a year from now. You guys were sitting pretty in this qualification journey. You had Uruguay for America's one, two game series. Looked like it was potentially the time you were going to qualify. But is, is, is this what you would have liked coming into last year's qualifications, this sort of time with the guys? Yes, obviously. I mean, you would love to have had that kind of a preparation time um, if, we, if we were able to do so. It's just unfortunate it didn't work out like that. I mean, it wasn't something that we could, uh, we could control. Uh, we, we weren't able to get together at that period of time, so it was a little bit unfortunate. Um, you know, and fair play to, you know, to the South American teams that we played against, you know, but I think what one lesson that we all have learned around the world of rugby is, is um, have a look at the preparation that they did, you know, Uruguay, uh, playing uh, as as, as uh, Penarol and uh, Chile playing as Seltham in a in the SLA competition and um, I think when we played Chile now in the last in the last encounter they had been together for 33 weeks since February last year so that goes a hugely long way from a cohesion point of view and being able to spend time together and and to your point that's the reason why weeks like this are so critically important for us and, and so valuable and then let's let's move on to Chile like it, you know another second chance saloon coming in as America's two and you know the first you know just scraped an away win away uh, from home, you know, this is where, you know, it actually came unstuck, 19 nil up, you know, not trying to get on your heartstrings now or, or get you too worked up, but just talk us a little bit about that game. Yeah, oh, it was a train smash, really. Um, yeah, still have sleepless nights about it. it uh, 
yeah, it didn't go according to plan. You know, I mean, 19 nil up, we were cruising, 31st minute. Um, right here in this corner here, we had an opportunity for a driving mall. We had driven quite well that day. Unfortunately, we lost the ball. Um, they kicked it, we ended up down in that bottom half. And, you know, then there was a penalty from the penalty. We gave a yellow card away. They kicked the corner and before we knew it, they'd scored twice and it was 1914. And it was just like within a, a wave of a one, somebody had uh, taken the wind out of our sails. But it's a learning curve, you know, Corbs, it's a, it's, it's a tough way to learn. And, and I, th I think, and I believe, you know, some of the best teams and some of the best athletes in the world have learned in very difficult circumstances. And that's where we are at right now. We're think, in difficult circumstances. I think adversity is where you grow. I think yeah. that that's the, you know, even from my, you know, battles with cancer and exactly. stuff. That was the man I always said is, you know, adversity, you've got to grow from it. And so that's my next question. What are the lessons sort of learned from that? And what are you trying to take in to this camp and into the autumn? Oh, a tremendous amount of lessons. I mean, again, um, I, I think we lost that game again, as opposed to them winning it. And, and I mean that with all due respect to them because they did put up a good battle and they were a good team and, you know, fair play to them. They won fair and square. But, you know, we did things that we went off plan, you know, and that's a big lesson for us. You know, it's a big lesson for us to reflect on that game and even reflect on the second Uruguay game as well, where, again, you know, we're, we're a good team. We're a really good rugby team when we stick to plan and everybody's on the program together. And, um, and again, I, I, I feel slightly defensive of the players as well, is, is, is that, you know, I mean, not having a huge amount of time together um, does mean that you, you, you do get rusty and you, you're not completely working um, as efficiently as you'd like to. And hence the reason why these are important camps. In fact, critical camps, times for us to spend together now and then, and then go abroad and play a couple of games where, where they, they, they're not World Cup qualifiers. They're just games where we can go out, we can try things, we can develop, we can grow, we can put our skills on the test and we can make mistakes and, and learn from them then. And, and that brings me on to the, the question, you know, a lot of these sort of losses in recent times have come in the second half or later in the games where you actually look very competitive early. Is fitness an issue? It's something AJ McGinty touched on in, in an interview last week. That's something I think collectively the Eagles, but almost himself as well, coming back from injury. Fitness wasn't good enough in that game where it sort of, it is at altitude, but felt falling apart at home. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I think it, it, it all ties into the same thing, you know, lack of time together, you know, a crucial time together. If we, if we don't have our hands and our eyes on the boys, then it's very difficult. You know, rugby is a very difficult sport, as you well know. Corps playing at the highest level. It's a very difficult sport to get fit for. You know, you can't just go for a 5K jog every day and hope that you're going to be ready to take a high-impact collision uh, game of 80 minutes. And, and hence the reason why we've got experts in the field that we do have, you know, so... Uh, yes, I, I accept what you say. I, I do think as a, as a group and as a squad, we weren't fit enough and we're not fit enough, still no. aren't. Um, and that's what we, we're putting in the time and energy for at the moment now. But we, we need the time together to be able to do that. And how important is, you know, obviously this time you guys have the guys in camp and you'll have a build up. Your internationals will come in sort of later to the mix. But how important is it as well for the MLR to really, you know, keep the emphasis on the fitness and the conditioning of the games. A lot of those games are on smaller fields, yeah. you know, turf sometimes not. How important is that piece in the puzzle so that when you come into those July windows, you get that sort of fitness and continuity where guys, it isn't a massive step up from when they've been playing week in, week out. Yeah, I know it's a huge thing. I mean, that look, the reality is um, it's, it's on everybody's lips is, is player welfare. Player welfare and mental health and part and parcel of that is being able to prepare our guys physically to be able to endure high level rugby matches. And so I actually think as, as ourselves as coaching groups and strength and conditioning groups and the MLR and as clubs and franchises, we have a responsibility to the players. We have a responsibility to ensure that they are fit enough playing the game because uh, it's scientifically known and injuries occur more when, you, when you're fatigued, when you're tired, when you're not fit enough, uh, let alone us even starting to get into the whole concussion conversation, but you know, just general day-to-day uh, -day injuries that we want to and can avoid on a rugby field um, can be avoided by us being fitter. And, and look, I mean, the, 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 bottom, the bottom line, it's, it's, it's been for age and a day, um, how often you find um, on paper, one rugby team is potentially better than another one, but that rugby team's fitter you know, and with that fat, fitness brings you confidence. You know what it's like playing the game at the top level when you fit. You feel a sense of confidence, you know, where you don't want to be pacing yourself through a game because you're not fit enough and trying to 
catch a breath and wait until they get to the next scrum. And you don't want the players doing that, you know. So we have a responsibility to them. And then, you know, you know, touched on the MLR a little bit, but I think it's got a, deserves a lot of credit too. Like how valuable Absolutely. is it for you as a head coach to have this league domestic, yeah. to have a squad of guys who are here who aren't just playing club rugby in the United States, but are at least in some form of professional environment and sort of able to devote full time to the sport? Yeah, I'll go back to, let's take ourselves out of the equation, how critical MLR is for us. I mean, I'll go back to, you know, two seasons of SLA, literally two seasons of SLA, and look how really, really well Chile, Uruguay, Brazil, how, how well they've improved as teams, you know? I mean, exactly the same situation as us going into this repechage, you know, teams we're playing against now, you know, Portugal, Kenya, those are not teams that you take for granted anymore, you know? A couple of years ago, literally two years ago, we were giving teams like that 70 points. Now you don't do that anymore. So, you know, that's what the MLR have hopefully brought us. They've brought us a good level, a high quality level, high quality of coaching, high quality of rugby, week in and week out, what we call daily training environments so that the guys get used to what the load is about. And uh, yeah, I'm incredibly grateful that as the Eagles coach that, that, that the MLR is around in my time. No, hugely. And then, you know, let's talk a bit about these windows. You have warm-up games coming up before the, these big games. Like, how important that is for the squad and, and how are you able to pull off and get those scheduled? Yeah, they've, they're absolutely vital. I mean, I think going, going into these playoff games again cold, as we've, as we've done with Chile and Uruguay, was when I mean, you asked the question earlier, you know, what lessons did we learn? I think that's one of the biggest lessons. You know, again, I talk about this responsibility that we have towards the players. You know, we have to give the players the best chance under difficult circumstances, but the best chance to be prepared as we possibly can. And one of those things is, you know, you want the guys having game time before they go into games that, that are higher pressure situations and that are more meaningful. And that hasn't been the case, you know, and, and that was what we felt, you know, going in against a, a, a Chilean team that was basically made up of Selknam and yeah. they li di didn't lose any players and you almost felt you were behind the blackboard because you're playing against a team you're playing week in and week out. So we've done that. We, we've, we've replicated that. We've fixed the problem. We've found a solution and we've got a couple of games down in South Africa and the reason we, we, we chose there as well is we, we're going down to Bloemfontein which is which is also at altitude, altitude yep. um, and also from a geographical point of view, once we once we've finished the, and we've acclimatized in South Africa, you know, at time zone wise, it's not too difficult for us to, to be able to fly in because obviously Portugal aren't going to be affected by the time zones and Kenya aren't going to be affected by the time zone. So, I mean, it's critically important that every piece of detail is uh, is, is taken into consideration for our preparation. So a good couple of games down in South Africa against some very good teams and then and then up to, to, to Dubai to, to try and finish the job. Are you feeling a lot of pressure coming in? Um, I, I, I feel pressure because I put the pressure on myself, you know. Um, I don't necessarily feel, uh, I don't feel the pressure uh, fr from anything other than the, the pressure that I exert on myself. Um, and I desperately, desperately want this team to do well. I want USA to do well. So, um, of course, there's a huge amount of pressure. Um, you know, I, I think there'd be, I think, you know, the USA rugby public would have a problem if their coach didn't take it personally, you know, and I take it personally, you know, for me, this is, you know, this is the job that I was asked to do and, and I've, got to, I've got to deliver, you know, to the USA rugby fans and to the people who've supported us and to these players, this group of players. And I, I desperately want, I want us to deliver. So yes, because of that, you feel the pressure, but you try and keep that in perspective. Corpse, you know, at the end of the day, you try and keep that in perspective. When you think about your family and you think about friends and you think about friends who've been through illnesses, you know, you just keep it in perspective. But it is a, it is a very important moment for us. It is critically important that we, we qualify, but, I think uh, this is really the time now for us to try and stay away from cliches, but we really just have to control what we can control at the moment, you know. The, the pressure is what the pressure is. There's nothing I can do about that, you know. Every day we just got to come to work and do the very best job that we can do. And, and I must say, you know, credit to the players. They, they're working their backsides off at the moment. Mate, completely agree. I, I know how invested you are as a coach and, and you can just see it even being here in training camp. You know, very fortunate to be able to be involved and, and be with you guys here. But, you know, like, how hard has it been for you personally through the summer, through the results, you know, COVID, the frustrations? Like, how have you found it? Yeah, it's been difficult. It's been difficult. There have been some dark days, but I, you know, I'm, 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 I know, and I've been, I've been around long enough to know that two things, I suppose. Firstly, I'm doing the job I love, so I'm incredibly grateful to that. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't really want to be anywhere else, so, 
you know, I'm incredibly grateful to have that. And I, I, I need, I constantly keep tap, tapping into that, uh, you know, th that gratuity. And then secondly, I, I know that one day, you know, as is all, always the case, when we look back at the harder times, as we, you know, when we reflect and we learn our, our toughest lessons and, you know, dare I even say it, we might even look back with a bit of a laugh on one or two of these things. But, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a rough 18 months. It's been a, it's, it's been a rough time, and, and, you know, since the last World Cup and um, not through anybody's fault. It's, it's just been a... It's just been a, a time of rebuilding and, and I just feel that we are so close to being on the cusp, you know. Uh, we are so close to being on the cusp of something really exciting happening and bringing this group together. And, and um, I would very much love this group to be able to go to next year's World Cup and, and, and show what they can do. And say, let's look at that, say this World Cup, say there is qualification or future going forward. What would you envision as a schedule that you would like for your team? Like, is this going to be the norm from now on that you get these windows, these games rolling into the autumn sort of off the back of the MLR so these guys can stay in almost more of a year round rugby season? Certainly. I mean, again, you asked me a question that's a little bit above my pay grade, but as a coach, what yeah. I can say... I'm asking you, yeah, what your desire is. My, de my desire would be for the guys to have a six-month window where they go to their clubs, where they play rugby with their clubs, where they get to spend time with their teams, and then when uh, they get a little bit of downtime, and then um, they would be able to assemble within an Eagles environment, whatever that looks like, whether we're going to be playing warm-up games or training games or having training camps, be able to align ourselves and then be able to, to, be able to go and, and do something like we're doing in South Africa, which participates in this Toyota Cup, play three games there, have our w window in July when we play our internationals and then have our November window as well. So um, all in all, when you look back at it, probably out of a 12-month year, probably have 10 months. And, and then the guys have... Uh, you know, two months of downtime, rest, relaxation, get away, spend time with their families, recoup, get their bodies right again and, and hit the ground running. So it's just to periodize that period, that passage of time that they get enough game time, but that they're enthusiastic and hungry enough to come back in. And ideally, would that be some form of like central contract or system ideally. where these guys can then, you know, bank on themselves for a yearly wage, they can fully commit to rugby. And because a lot of the guys who do the MLR in the off season are working jobs, or doing all sorts and trying to stay fitness almost on a semi-pro level at a season. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, whether it's centrally contract, centrally contracted, or it's joint contracted that they have a contract with the MLR and they have some form of a contract with the union, or however it works, just for them to have the peace of mind to know that, you know, they've got, as you say, they've got a they've got a peace of mind for 12 months, that they've got a salary, that they've got an income coming in. They make tremendous sacrifices, Corbs. As you know, I can only imagine how much time you must have been away from home. But it, people don't understand that that logistically for for us, the American players, it's even harder because the dist distances are so much further. So when we assemble, say, for example, here in Denver, uh, they don't have an MLR club here. So everybody who's assembled with us here is away from home. So we wanted a two-week period. We think it's fine as coaches to have a two-week period, but we've got three or four or five guys who've just got newborn babies, yeah. you know, and it's unfair on their wives to, you know, bring them in here and then go to South Africa for three weeks and then go to Dubai for three weeks. You know, by the time November 19th comes along, a handful of these guys have been away for eight weeks, you know, and they've yeah. got young babies and, and young families back home. So we need to take into consideration, and, and they're not earning money. So, yeah. you know, so but, we need to take into consideration that, that you know, we... We have to try and find solutions to those challenges. Absolutely. It almost makes me, well, it does make me respect the guys more and the, the journey and the commitment they have. The fact they are chasing the dream for yeah. such, you know, little financial sort of reward. It's, it's quite incredible. It is incredible. And, you know, I've often, I've often said it before is, is, you know, so many, it's such a, I've always found it a bizarre question. Like somebody who said to me, like, why, why would you come and coach in America? But, you know, the values here are, are still really amazing old school values. I mean, to all intent and purposes, whilst they behave as fully fl fledged professionals compared to the Premiership or Top 14 or Super Rugby or URC or any of these major competitions in the world, these guys are not getting paid enough as, a, as professional rugby players yet. Yeah. Yet. And so they literally are making sacrifices. You know, there are guys in this group who um, are losing money to yeah. be here. That, that, that is the truth. Uh, I can mention a handful of guys who've, who've got full-time jobs who actually do really well for themselves and they, they're losing out on that income to be able to come here. But 
but they want to be here. Yep. You know, they want to make a difference. They want to play for their country. And, you know, I love that. You know, I love them. That's why I lo love being, being here and doing what I do. That, that's, that's like one of the emotional drivers for a team. And I think that's it's something it. that should be part of the culture is, is reminding everyone why, why they do this and, and the journey and stuff that that's they're right. on. And, and also like, you know, how some teams may take it for granted and stuff because it's just all they know is high paying professional job. But this is really what, it, what it's about. Yeah, exactly right, you know, and, you know, that's the reason why, you know, for me, I'm very appreciative of this group of players and um, you know, I always f feel I have to thank them every time they come into camp, you know, they're necessarily doing me a favour, but they, they're certainly doing the country a favour and, and they want to be here, you know, and then you see them put the effort in that they've done today on, on a session like this and, you know, it... it um, it, you, you, you remind yourself of why we coach, you know, because, I, because, I, because this is what I love. Absolutely, you know? mate. And Gary, you can just see the passion in you, mate. I love it. Absolutely love it. I'm very similar. Things probably get on so well. But, you know, th this camp, these guys, they're so valuable. But also how valuable it is to have a core group of guys that are playing in Europe or in, in, in the top, top sort of leagues in the world that can come in and sort of raise standards and, and pass on some of the knowledge they're picking up there. Well, it is important as well as, you know, and we, we might, you know, there's no point in not talking about the elephant in the room. At the end of the day, it's a professional sport. And if these guys are going to apply their, apply their trade as professionals, they deserve to get paid. And, you know, I think one of the aspirations for a lot of the players playing MLR rugby at the moment is to go and hunt a big contract, you know. Um, if you Joe Tafete or if you uh, AJ McGinty or you Greg Peterson and, you know, somebody's going to come and come and scout you and, and hunt you because they've seen you play a good level of rugby and then they're going to offer you decent money. And you can't begrudge a young, a young professional rugby player in his 20s to want to aspire to A, playing at a higher level of rugby and B, earning as much money as he possibly can. So it, it's great, you know, it's great. Where it starts becoming tricky is if the guys are playing in Europe and they're not getting regular game time. Yeah. So if they've been signed in Europe and they're backups to maybe local players and they're not getting game time, that puts us in a bit of a predicament every now and again. But by and large, you know, the guys that we've got in Europe at the moment are actually, you know, they're playing. You know, Greg, Greg played 80 yeah. minutes in the weekend. AJ's playing now for Bristol. Um, Joe's, Joe's playing for playing Leicester. Up, yeah. so, so it's great, you know, it's, it's great to see. Yeah, so having these international players come in and they're sort of key components of the team, how hard is it though not having any camp time with them like do you keep a lot of are they open in the loop even now or does it ramp up closer to the game where they start getting in the loop of what's going on especially someone like AJ yeah. who's probably your, your playmaker and, and general out there you know how hard is that that they only come in right at the end no it is difficult of course it is very difficult and it's uh, it's almost something we still haven't really got our heads around I mean uh, it's probably an unsolvable solution in many ways in, in as much as it is what it is and um, to answer your question we've also got to be mindful you know day in and day out I understand the pressures of the premiership and and uh, as do you and um it, it it is a really intense competition as is top 14 so i'm also very mindful that it's not fair on the players if you know i'm feeding them video every single day and watch training and give me feedback and tell me about this i've also got to be able to get yeah. the balance between that as well for them but the closer we get towards the games most definitely the guys will be will be looped in and, and circled in i mean modern technology is amazing today you know on on platforms like huddle and stuff the guys our trainings are available 20 30 minutes after training so they can all sit down and watch it and they do i mean again i'm really not just saying this but they're unbelievably professional group of players and um often getting feedback from the guys in europe and and, and getting some some good feedback from the guys so I, I i know that by and large the guys often do get to watch training and get to see what we're doing and are very well versed by the time we come into camp but in an ideal situation of course we'd like to be in camp together with everybody for a four or five week runway into it that would just be World Cups, I imagine, where you'll yeah. get that runway with players. But That's then it. sort of the team, you know, having this time now together, is it allowing you to add layers to the game plan? Are we going to see more from USA Rugby? Like you said, maybe take some risks out in South Africa. Is it the same sort of game plan that you've seen under you over these last couple of years? Or are we going to try and use this time to sort of grow and, and build more out there? Yeah, I know. Look, I mean, our first job is that we've got to win in November, you know, and I think we've got to find a way where we can we can as effectively as possible win the game, uh, win those three games. Um, again, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to take the opposition lightly. So um, from our point of view, I mean, we're going to have to play a very pragmatic game. As you mentioned earlier, we must take into consideration the heat. 
I mean, it's going to be in Dubai. I mean, there's no time in Dubai that's that's not minimum 30 degrees. So uh, we believe that that could be to our advantage because obviously we're training here in Denver and it's at, at altitude and we're going to be in the heat and the sun of South Africa as well as preparation. So it is going to be an, a, a must-win game. But in answer to your question, yes, I do want to put some layers onto it. And we have, uh, it's, it's why we've got, you know, guys like Steve Brett in here, you know, I mean, we, we, we want to play an attacking brand of rugby. Um, ultimately, we want to beat teams because we're scoring tries. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what we want to do. And that's how we're going to win rugby games. So, um, of course, we're looking to evolve. Um, we just need more time in the middle to be able to, to, to get that right and, and make better decisions and, and be able to play that, that brand of rugby under pressure. And then lastly, you know, this is how big a commitment is this for you? You spend a lot of time away from your family and everything. You really are sort of all invested in this side. Just talk a little bit about that. Whew. Uh, yeah, it is. It, it is a big commitment and it, it, it does take its toll on the family, on, on my, myself, uh, you know, and uh, my family. I've got, I've got two kids as well. And um, it, it's, it's been a while that I've been doing this and, um, it's interesting though. I'm in my, I can't believe I'm in my fifth year with USA Rugby at the moment, and you think you get used to the travel, but you, you just don't. I mean, you know, 27 to 36 hours of travel is, you know, it takes its toll on the body, you know, and takes its toll on your mind as well. And um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a difficult period of time, but you know, I'm very grateful that you know this is this is a dream of mine, and you know, I've you know I've got a very supportive family, and they know that this is what I want to do, and um, having an opportunity like this to work for USA Rugby and, you know, as I said earlier, Corbs, you know, being on the cusp of us being able to really do something great over the next eight years, I would like to just be able to leave some small piece of legacy if, if, if I'm able to, you know, in the, small, in the short period of time that I'm here that, you know, leading into 27 and leading into 31 because I'm quite sure I won't be here around then you know that some form of a some form of a um of of a of a of a foundation has been laid in terms of what it should look like you know what should a professional team look like what should the USA look like and and I think slowly but surely we 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 turning that tanker in the harbor uh, and that's what it's taken you know and there's so much work that's gone on behind the scenes I know you know there's it's it's very easy just to slate USA Rugby and mistakes that have happened in the past but there's been so much good work that's been done by by the guys after the last couple of years and you know I, I just think it it's been underestimated what an unbelievable achievement it, it has been by by administrators to get get a Rugby World Cup here in 2031 you know and that's going to happen you know so while we talk about the here and now and we talk about what's going to happen obviously you and I and now we vested here we really want to go to this World Cup in 12 months time but the fact of the matter is, you know, there is an unbelievable runway for USA Rugby. And that is that uh, there's going to be a World Cup in 27. There's going to be a home World Cup in 31. And, Incredible. You know, and those guys are 15 to 18 years, 15 to 18 to even 23, 24 years old now. So that's where we need to be investing our time and money and infrastructure at the moment. No, and then that, that's probably the last question is like how, you know, how big an opportunity is it having the Rugby World Cup here for a growth, for the sport, for everything? So say you having this role in 10, 15 years, if there's a World Cup in, in 31 here, like how exciting is that for the prospects of USA Rugby? Well, I think it's unbelievably exciting, but I think, I think on the other side of it being exciting, I think it was critical. I think um, if it didn't happen, it, it needs to happen for the game to get some form of exposure in this country. I mean, uh, we've spoken about it and, and all these these cliches that go around about sleeping giants and, and all that nonsense. You know, the fact of the matter is uh, the world needs to see that USA can host a World Cup and that USA can put a team that's competitive. And even if it's not right now, and it's, it, it will be by then. And infrastructure has already gone into place. You've mentioned the MLR earlier. You know, we need to have, we need to also put time and energy, which has been done into pathways programs, um, U16s, U15s, U18s coming through now, how they're being developed. There's amazing work that's been done with the Talent ID game, by the Talent ID camps of which there were 13 or 15 around the country. There's now over 30 boys in San Diego as we speak who are in a three month academy camp as we speak right now. And they'll be playing down in, in Uruguay in, in October while we play in South Africa. So. You know, there's a massive drive to, to, to drive 
the appreciation for the game and, and it needs to you know, go further down into the high schools and, and get that appreciation. But once Rugby World Cup comes here, like the Soccer World Cup did in 94, I think you'll see it. I think you'll see a massive uptake of the game and um, by then it'll really put, put the game on the map in the USA. Let's hope, mate. Let's hope. And I think that's a great way to finish, Gary. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. Good, I man. really appreciate it. All the best, All Corbs. the best, mate. Thanks, Good luck bro. with everything. And that is a wrap on the show. Thank you so much to Gary coming on. So honest, so forthcoming. Such great insight. You know, a guy who is working tirelessly to try and get USA Rugby into this Rugby World Cup, which we have on NBC Sports. And we're really hoping that the USA do qualify. I think everyone in rugby around the world is. But that's really a wrap on this episode. Thanks for listening. As always, keep liking, sharing, favoriting, retweeting, sharing our content. All of that stuff, we really appreciate it. We're trying to grow this pod. Keep growing week on week. Thanks for your support, and we'll see you again soon.